My topic is uh, assigned. It is 2 Kings 2. My title is, We Have No Continuing City. That's clearly a New Testament reference uh, where Paul shows that we are not connected to the things of this earth. But I'm using it as just kind of a connected thought to 2 Kings 2, because 2 Kings 2 is all about the progress of the church as the time of the end begins until the church is glorified. We'll take a look at it in some detail. Uh, I'm going to just start with verse 1. And it came about when the Lord was about to take up Elijah by word unto him that Elijah went with Elijah from Gilgal. So we have to sort of define this, this verse and this destination. First of all, it says the Lord was about to take up Elijah. Well, that's going to be the focus of this chapter. 2 Kings 2. We have to get there first, and a lot happens. This chapter actually begins at the time of the end, 1999, and is going to uh, take us to the destination. And who is going? Well, it says it's going to take up Elijah. That's the ch How? By a whirlwind. Uh, I think that translation is faulty. We'll talk about that later. But it does show something about the departure of the church. It also mentions Elisha. So you have to say, well, okay, the Lord's going to take up Elijah in a whirlwind. What about Elisha? And the answer is, he doesn't go at the same time. He goes later. Um, Elisha, prophetically, is strictly a time of the end character. We don't see him before the time of the end appears in prophecy. And I think the reason is, as the time of the end progresses, that's when the separation begins to be explained and accomplished. I want to take a look at a connection here with the famous parable in Matthew 25, 1, which is about the separation of the wise and the foolish virgins, the separation of Elijah and Elisha. Matthew 25, 1. Then the kingdom of heaven will be comparable well, when's then? I think this is also a 1799 and following picture. Then, time of the end, the kingdom of heaven will be comparable to 10 virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. <laughs> and that's precisely what happened. As the uh, time of the end began, Bible study began to proliferate all over. Thank you. You're the handout is now on the screen. Bible study began to proliferate at the beginning of the 19th century. And the brethren, the 10 virgins, did take their lamps, and it turned into the Second Advent movement, which we usually call the Miller movement. And this parable follows it, and uh, by the time we get to verse 6, when midnight there was a shout, behold, the bridegroom come out to meet him. So um, the parable of the wise and foolish virgins is doing the same thing that 2 Kings 2 is doing. It is starting back as the time of the end begins. Also mentioned in this first verse of 2 Kings 2 uh, and following. We've got a journey of relocations. 
two relocations because we are starting out in one location and going to do more. And there's an event mentioned. They are all mentioned by place names. So that's the, um, that's the story. And we will try to follow this journey now, this next point on your handout, the theory of, series of residencies. We're going to see place names, Gilgal, Bethel, Jericho, Jordan. And in prophecy, as Brother Russell so eloquently taught us, places represent conditions. So the place names, their etymologies, are going to tell us about certain conditions the church goes through starting at the time of the end, and if we can identify those conditions, then we can date them. We can get a schedule for this journey from one place to another. Back in 2 Kings 2, verse 2, Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. So obviously, verse 1, they were in Gilgal. But you notice the preposition. Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. So we're starting where they were in 1799. And we're headed toward Bethel. So the first thing here, leaving where they were to go to two other conditions. They are going to be leaving Gilgal. In 1799, the church is leaving what the French Revolution had ended. Gilgal means a rolling away. I'm going to suggest that this takes us from 1799 to 1874. This is the time that Bible proliferation really spread. So we've got two things happening during this 75 years, the first 75 years of the 19th century. We've got the Miller movement, and we've got the cleansing of the sanctuary. They're related because the study of scripture, the second ad movement, all helped to clean out the errors that had built up over the centuries. So I'm suggesting two. I think Brother David's frozen. Brother David, we're. Uh... Yeah, we may have lost him on that. We'll give him a moment to come back. Brother Mark, if you put that talk in the chat, we can all share it. Yeah, we we put it in there earlier. I'll put that in again. I'm back. Okay, thank I you. I apparently was cut off. Can you hear me? We can. Some, you can. Okay. Let's continue then. The two kinds of rolling away that occur during Gilgal. There was a rolling away of papal persecution powers in 1799 and following. That's when Napoleon basically put an end to the papal power to persecute. That was rolled away as a burden on the church also rolled away because of biblical proliferation and the Second Advent Movement, was the rolling away of errors. That happened or was completed by 1846, which we call the cleansing of the sanctuary. So here is the journey from 2 Kings 1 to the days of Brother Russell. 2 Kings 2, verse 1, Elijah went with Elisha from 
Gilgal. Verse 2 ends, so they went down to Bethel. Now, as you can see on your handout, there's a new dwelling place. They had dwelt previously in the entire Protestant Reformation period. And then they journeyed until they get to Bethel. Uh, I personally just call that journey, that first 75 years of the 19th century, as the great exodus. The brethren were getting out of making all the denominations that had existed since Luther, and they were traveling toward the harvest. And they finally get there. Bethel means the house of God. And uh, in my mind, the house of God is 1874 to 1914. Very much related to 1 Kings 19. And I know I'm treading here on Brother Rick's territory, but I'm just going to make reference to it. And I'm not going to go into it in great detail. <clears throat> in 1 Kings 19... <clears throat> seven and eight. The angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him, that's Elijah, said, arise, eat, because the journey is too great for you. This is a new meal. This is what Brother Russell served. So he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the Mount of God. <clears throat> that is the Bethel period the house of God period, the 40 years basically of Brother Russell's ministry. Uh, Bethel is the house of God. I think this is the period of blessed dwelling of joy, peace, learning, unity. Let me make an observation on the first Kings 19, eight. This is a prophecy that the 1914 expectations would fail. But we only see that if we get the meaning, the derivation, the etymology of the word Horeb. And the word Horeb is just a second. I thought I wrote that down and I didn't. Oh, yes, I did. Okay. Desolate. Now, we all know that the mountain of God, the kingdom of God is not desolate, but their expectations in that 40 years were desolate about it. So it says, verse 8, he, Elijah, arose, ate and drank and went in the strength of that food, the harvest message, um, we're pointing out that 1 Kings 19, 7, and 8 shows the failure of expectations concerning the kingdom. Nevertheless, that 40-year period, Bethel, was blessed, joyful, peaceful, learningful, and unified under Brother Russell. Now, interestingly enough, I uh, love verse 9. Then he came there to a cave, that's Elijah, and lodged there. And I think pretty much that cave is going to be the equivalent of Jericho as we get there, uh, or at least its beginnings. But notice what happens. He came there to a cave and lodged there, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, you doing here, Elijah? And I think that's a wonderful statement in that it shows how the church has been plagued by the 1914 disappointment. It had to get over it. Uh, brethren, we're still getting over it. 
conversations about 1914, harvest ending, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, has gone on ever since. And the Lord simply comes to Elijah there at the end of Bethel and says, Elijah, what are you doing here? In other words, get up, pick up your pieces and go on. And that brings us to Jericho. Jericho means fragrance. I'm suggesting that this dwelling place of fragrance is 1914 until now. We're still in it. It is the long and leaderless period of developing faithfulness, despite the fact that Brother Russell's not in our presence anymore, despite that we have no leadership to replace him and shouldn't. I, a clue to the meaning of this word fragrance, I think we have in the church of Thyatira in Revelation 2.18. Thyatira was really the low spot in the church's history because prophecy was so strong and it was so difficult for the church to function. Thyatira means sweet perfume of sacrifice. I'm sure you can see the connection there. Jericho means fragrance. Thyatira means sweet perfume of sacrifice. And the link in concept is this. Ever since Brother Russell's death, it is a fragrance to the Lord if we have stayed faithful to what he has delivered, build on it, Polish up the rough edges, be characters under the circumstances that have existed ever since 1914. So we are, ever since then, living in the Jericho condition. All right, now, something happens in the progress. The church left Gilgal. It dwelt 40 years in Bethel. We have gone 110 years in Jericho, and we still have not come to what is Jordan. In 2 Kings 2, 6, then Elijah said to him, please stay here for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. And he said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Now, 50 men of the sons of the prophets went and stood opposite them at a distance while the two of them stood by the Jordan. And Elijah took his mantle and folded it together and struck the waters. And they were divided here and there so that the two of them crossed over on dry ground. Now, it came to pass when they had crossed over that Elijah said to Elisha, and I'm not going to continue reading, but the fact is they walked around together. So we have come not to a place of dwelling. Jordan was not a place they dwelt. Jordan was a place that an event occurred. They crossed it. That's it. They didn't dwell there. They just crossed it not a new dwelling place. And the focus was on the two of them. And I think the reason is that Jordan is going to represent the closing of the door of opportunity for spirit. We're not there yet. The word Jordan means judge down. It's yet to come. And I think the concept, I'm rearranging re re the words, but I think the concept is judgment is passed down. What judgment is passed down? The judgment that's passed down is you, Elijah, are the church. You, Elisha, are the great company. The door of opportunity has shut. The church is finished. Not on the other side of the veil, because they still walk after Jordan together but it's finished. 
The judgment has been passed. The two are separate classes, very much again related to the parable in Matthew 25, where Elijah says to Elisha, or the wise say to the foolish, uh, you need to go out and buy the stuff you don't have. <clears throat> Okay, so Jordan is an event. You'll notice what happens. They smite the waters. Now, I think brethren have put the focus on the smiting of the waters, and I think that is just totally misplaced. We have other instances of smiting waters. Moses smote the Red Sea. It opened up, they passed on, and what happened? Type changed. Before Israel, see, it represented the world of mankind. When they got on their side, they represented the church in the wilderness. The picture changed. The same thing happened with Joshua after the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. He smote the Jordan, and the people crossed over into the promised land. And the picture changed. So the smiting of the water is not about the waters, but it's about getting to the other side. Uh, let me read the second Kings again. Verse eight. Elijah took his mantle and folded it together and struck the waters, and they were divided here and there. Notice the next two words. So that the two of them crossed over on dry ground. It gives the objective of smiting the waters. It doesn't have anything to do with the waters. It just allows them to pass to the other side. You know, it's the old expression, why did the chicken cross the road? It's very simple. He wanted to get to the other side. And that's exactly what happens with all of these smitings of water. It's not about the water. When they, Moses smote the Red Sea, it wasn't about the Red Sea. It was about the people. When Joshua smote the Jordan, it wasn't about the waters of the Jordan. It was about Israel changing itself in typical meaning, and nothing has changed. We have another smiting here of Jordan, and what has changed is the church is complete. The judgment has been passed down. The church and great company are now two separate classes. <clears throat> the one thing about this mantle Uh, Elijah folded it in half. There's a wonderful clue as to what that means in the book of Hebrews. And I'm going to look with you at Hebrews 1, verse 12. And as a mantle... Thou wilt roll them up. Well, okay, there's a context there. And uh, it has to do with the fact that the Lord changes ages from one to another. And as a mantle, thou wilt roll them up. And as a garment, they will also be changed. But thou art the same, etc. What happens is, when you fold a mantle in half and put it away, it means its work is done. The work of the Elijah class is done there. A new situation has arrived. So the folding up of the mantle is Elijah acknowledging that his authority and the authority of the Elijah class during the whole age was to find the Elijah class. His authority for his work is completed. And there's something new starting at the door is closed. Okay, next part. Uh, can you, yes. 
arriving at the destination. The two are separated. Let me get back to Kings. I misplaced my bookmark. Second Kings 2. When we get down to uh, verse 11, then it came about as they were going along and talking that behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire, which separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a word and to heaven. Uh, I know the common definition of brethren about chariots is organizations. And I think there's nothing in scripture to suggest that that's correct. Chariots are a symbol of military might. Uh, let me give you right from 2 Kings an example of that. Uh, chapter 6, this is dealing with Elijah, Elisha, excuse me, uh, verse 17. Let me start with 15. Now, when the attendant of the man of God had risen early and gone out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was circling the city. And his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? So he, Elisha, answered, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Now, in verse 15, chariots and horses were an invading army. Verse 17, Then Elisha prayed and said, O Lord, I pray, his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he saw, and behold, the mountains were full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. In other words, the military might of the Lord was there. Now, let's go back to where we were in chapter 2. Verse 11. Then it came about as they were going along and talking that behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire, which separated the two of them. Okay. The chariot of fire, I suspect, is the Lord's military might that is tearing the world apart at that point in time. when uh, Elijah will be taken up. It will be the Lord's military might in world events that will indeed take up the church. I'm, uh, by the way, this chariot of fire thing is only used one more time in the Bible, and that's the one I read to you in, in chapter 6, verse 17. I'm going to suggest a connection here with Revelation 16, the plagues, to see what kind of military might the Lord is using here at the time this happens. In the sixth plague, starting in verse 13, we see a collusion of dragon, beast, and false prophet. In other words, civil and religious cooperation. They are teaching something. That's the spirits. They are unclean in that they have nothing whatsoever to do with what the Lord might approve. Verse 14, the demons are behind it. Verse 15, the parenthetical verse, the important verse, this is where the Lord speaks to Elijah because Elijah is just about to leave in this chariot of fire that is going to be resulting from this collusion of dragon beast and false prophet. 
Behold, I am coming like a thief. That's not about the second advent. Coming in prophecy very frequently means taking an action, not arriving. Behold, I am coming like a thief. I think the action taken there is the closing of the door. Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and keeps his garments. Notice he's already awake, but he has to stay awake. He's already clothed, but he has to keep his garments. Why? Lest he walk about naked, ill-clothed, and they see his shame. In other words, this is the church's last attempt to live up to its professions. This is the time the Lord is saying, now is it, you won't have an opportunity after this. And so we get the gathering of the nations of the whole world together to the condition called Armageddon, which is the destruction of their mountain. And as the seventh plague starts, and those demons that were part of the arrangement have a bold portal, we get the completion of the church. It is done. Verse 17. Okay, let's go back to 2 Kings 2. <clears throat> this is where Elijah and Elisha are separated by the chariot of fire and the horses of fire. Uh, I'm going to suggest, I know we always say horses are doctrine, and I think that's true, but I think horses are primarily also a weapon of warfare which doctrine is. Doctrine is a weapon of spiritual warfare. So there's a double meaning. Elijah is in. In. I know it says by. But the Hebrew scholars don't agree with that. They say in. In other words, it's not the whirlwind that takes up Elijah. It is that he is taking up during this whirlwind, not by it. It's a time reference, not a mechanism reference. Elijah is taken up in a whirlwind. Okay, we've got to take a little side trip here. There are two Hebrew words, and you can study these for yourself, for whirlwind. One is a strong storm. The other is a hurricane or tornado that when it goes through, nothing's left. The one that Elijah is taken up in or during is the first kind, a strong storm. It is not the final trouble that the seventh plague finally erupts into. Elijah is taken up during a trouble, obviously one stimulated by beast, dragon, and false prophet, but it is not the whirlwind that destroys the world. So, important distinction, Elijah is taken up in or during a strong storm, but not by the storm that's going to wipe the earth clean. This brings us to Elisha's response. Verse 12. And Elisha saw it and cried out. Okay, this is his response. This is what he's feeling. My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and its horsemen, and he saw him no more. Then he took hold of his own clothes and tore them in two pieces 
He also took up the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and returned and stood before Jordan. Okay, what's happening here? Why would he call Elijah his father? And I think for good reason, the church is the faith father of the group. The Elisha class, the great company, is not secure. And whether they admit it while both are in the flesh or not, they feel the paternity. Let me give an example. Turn in 2 Kings to chapter 5, 13. This is the account where a, a Naaman had to go and wash in the river. But there's an interesting response here by Naaman's servants. Then his servants came near and spoke to him and said, my father. Well, Naaman wasn't their father. He was their leader. Just as Elijah is the leader of the spiritually spirit begotten. So here, then his servants came near and spoke to my father. I'm suggesting this is in 2.13 of Elisha's response. He is addressing the departed Elijah as the faith father of the group. Now, explaining how he views Elijah as the sentence continues, my father, my father, the, the chariot and its singular of Israel and its horsemen. He's describing how he saw Elijah. The chariot in this verse is not the chariot of the previous verse. But the meaning is the same. The chariot is an implement of war. And so he is saying in his response to the departure of Elijah, you were the chariot, the defender of spiritual Israel. You were the warriors for spiritual Israel. You were its horsemen. You know, horsemen are people who direct horses. And if horses are doctrines, or if he, doctrines used as battle weapons for the faith, he is saying, you are the chariot, the defender of spiritual Israel. You are its horsemen, the director of doctrinal direction. I'm going to paraphrase, I think, what Elisha was saying in his response. My example, my example, you have been the defender or chariot of spiritual, the director or horseman of its doctrinal clarity. That's going to happen in that Jeremiah 8 picture where the great company finally realizes when the church is gone that they're left behind and they've got to take up things for themselves, basically pick up the fallen mantle of Elijah. This realization on the part of the Elisha class of what the wise virgins were is a lament. And as in most laments in the Old Testament, he tore his garments. When you rend your garments, it is a sign of great sorrow. But I don't think it's an accident that he tears them in two. Garments in two parts. He's basically saying that the justification, which he is lamenting what is happening, is showing indeed that there are two groups. And he's unfortunately the one that's left behind. And when he picks up the mantle, the mantle is a sign of authority. 
Elisha is to finish the church's assignment. I'm not going to go back there because it's Rick's territory, but you will find out that in the end, when Elijah is gone, Elisha is the one who finishes some of the commissions or assignments that were given to Elijah. So there is an authority passed on to the great company at this time. We too often just uh, sort of brush the great company aside at the end, but once the church is gone, the Lord is going to use it mightily. Yes, it will be washing its robes, but this is not just what's going on. The Lord prophetically uses the great company to accomplish all kinds of things, some on behalf of Israel, some in the uh, final dissolution of the influences of Babylon, etc. There are many honors to the great company in the end. It does have a mantle. It does have authority. It does fulfill many prophecies. Okay, Elisha's portion. And here I will admit my ignorance. I have too many loose ends when it comes to the prophecies concerning Elisha. So I will not even attempt to explain much of what happens to Elisha past this point. I am not satisfied enough to interpret the rest of this chapter. But you will notice a little bit. 13. He also took up the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and returned and stood by the bank of the Jordan. In other words, he's returning in his mind to the event that was the important event where the church was finished. And whether Elisha knew it or not, and he didn't at that point in time, he was entering a new situation. And that's probably why he here smites the Jordan and crosses over because he is entering a new situation prophetically. Uh, in 2.14, interestingly, he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and struck the waters and said, where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? What an interesting question. And I'd like to go back to Habakkuk and see the connection of this question to what actually happens. In Habakkuk 3, I'd like to start with verse 16, which is where we never start, just to see the context and see the attitude of the great company. This is serious stuff here. The great company has an attitude of fear. Brethren, don't let yourself have it. Almost every religion in the world is afraid somebody's out to get them. We are not that way. We must not be that way. And yet it is a plague in the mind of the great company. Notice, it is speaking here. I heard and my inward parts tremble. They're scared to death. My inward parts trembled at the sound. My lips quivered. You get the picture. Decay enters my bones and in my place I tremble because I must wait quietly for the day of distress for the people to arise who will invade us. Does that sound familiar? You know, whether you're talking about the James Jones incident in, in that part of Christianity that, sure, everybody's going to come out to get them. This must not be our attitude. And yet it shows that for a while, that is what plagues the great company. It's just plain afraid that somebody's out to get it. And that's its concern. Then it sits down and reasons, though the fig tree 
should not blossom. There'd be no fruit on the vines, though the yield of the olive should fail and the fields produce no fruit, though the flock should be cut off from the fold and there should be no cattle in the stalls. You notice what he's doing here. He's going through prophecy and seeing where he is. This is when Elisha goes back to Jordan and says, what, what happened? And he realizes he is in this period when the church is gone the fulfillment of all the peaceable prophecies has not happened, and there he is, and he has to do something with that mantle that it is, is in his hand. Then he recovers. Yes, I will exult in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength, and he has made my feet like hinds feet and makes me walk on my high places. The great company finally stands up and does something, and then it will be glorified. One of the things verse 15 mentions is the sons of the prophets. That's uh, 2 Kings 2.15. I have no idea who they are, but I will drop a consideration into your lap. In Acts 3, a place we're all familiar with. But I'm going to read verse 25, which we don't stress often. Peter is talking to the Jews. It is you who are the sons of the prophets. And I think that may be the answer to the question here, because these sons of the prophets occur here at these end time events in 2 Kings 2. Israel is a factor. Israel is being established in order to be the earthly center of the kingdom. If we look in Song of Solomon, which I thought I had marked with a bookmark and I hadn't. So patience here, please. <clears throat> In Song of Solomon, starting with chapter 5, Jesus, I have come, this is first verse, I have come into my garden, my sister, my bride, I have gathered my myrrh along with my balsam, I have eaten my honeycomb, and my, I have drunk my wine, my etc., etc., and the great company answers, I was asleep, but my heart was awake. A voice, my beloved was knocking. Open to me, my sister, my darling, my love, my perfect one. And what does she say? I've taken off my dress. How can I put it on again? I've washed my feet. How can I dirty them again? She went to bed and she wasn't ready to open the door. It was a problem for her. And the great company doesn't, respond it's what makes it the great company notice verses eight and nine she's talking to the jews i adjure you O daughters of jerusalem if you find my beloved as to what you will tell him for i am lovesick what kind of beloved is your beloved that's the Jews responding, O oh, most beautiful among women. What kind of beloved is your beloved that thus you adjure us? And she answers, the one of the thing the great company will be doing among others is she will be talking to those who will become the faithful remnant of Israel that will be saved during the Ezekiel invasion. Notice when you finally get down to 6-1, this is the Jews speaking. Where has your beloved gone, O most beautiful among women? Where has your beloved turned? Notice this line and weep. That we may seek him with you. There, the faithful Jews accept Christ and are ready to enter into the new covenant. May the Lord add his blessing.